Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. And I'm Kirsten Oates. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Welcome to our second question and response episode for Turning to the Mystics Season 1, where we've been turning to the Christian mystic Thomas Merton. In today's episode, we'll focus on questions that came in about contemplative practice. Thank you so much for the fabulous questions. Uh, it's been wonderful to read your emails and listen to your thoughts and feedback. I'm sure all the questions today will be a, a help to everyone who's listening. If you're listening to this episode in real time, you'll be experiencing what we're experiencing, which is this chaotic, challenging time of coronavirus. Jim and I and Corey are here together online, uh, zooming in from our own shelter in environments and living with the ups and downs of, of this new experience. With that in mind, Jim, I wanted to start with a question around uh, getting advice about a practice we might use um, if we're having trouble sleeping. I myself ha have been having trouble sleeping since the coronavirus experience began. I find myself waking up between two and four most nights and my body is just wide awake and I, I can't get back to sleep. When I've shared this experience with friends and family, uh, I find a lot of people are having the same thing going on. And so I wondered if there's a practice or advice that you might have for those of us struggling with sleep these days. Yes. Um, well, a few thoughts. You know, first of all, I, I, with regarding to sleep, with your sleep, one, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to see what our normal patterns are. Because some people, uh, disturbance of sleep is an ongoing thing that's been with them for a long time. But the, the concerns about the pandemic and so on can exacerbate that. So it like increases a sleep disturbance problem that's already there. And likewise, whatever you do to help you, one, get to sleep and stay to sleep, you continue to be faithful to those, like whatever your little ritual is, a cup of chamomile, chamomile tea or warm shower, whatever you do, you, you would do that. Also to know that when you, when you, when you wake in the middle of the night and you can tell uh, what's on your mind is the images you just saw on television that day, heard on the media about this, and you start taking the magnitude in, and where's all this headed, and you know, and and so, but it, it gives rise then to feelings of anxiety, and I think also some kind of feelings of depression about such overwhelming suffering and uh, the uncertainty of it all. There's that. So what we're talking about now is simply what might help with that. See what would be some spiritual remedies that would help with that. A few thoughts. You have to try them on for size and see what helps you. You know, first, one thing that might help is to know that these, these disturbed feelings are entirely normal. They're, they're a very appropriate response to what's happening. So you're, you're like you're tuned in. But what we're trying to do is to recognize the ways in which the intensities of these concerns is cutting off experiential access to the presence of God sustaining us in the midst of these concerns, see, which is always there, breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. So what we can practice is how, what, what is a meditation practice? So it might be just reflecting on the presence of God is with us. It might be through our breathing. What is the practice that takes us to the deeper place that helps to reinstate us in this groundedness of God sustaining us, being there for and with us? And then how to then kind of hand our fears over to the care of God, that we take our troubled heart and we hand our troubled heart over into the care of God, sustaining us in the midst of our troubles and our fears so that our, our peace learns to reside in this loving presence of God that sustains us in the midst of this. And in a peace that's not dependent on the outcome of the effort whether it be our death, anyone's death, the death of the world, because it's a peace that isn't dependent on anything at all. It's a peace that transcends conditions, permeates conditions, sustains us in conditions. There's that might help. Another thing that helps is to know that, the, that not only are we united in our collective preciousness in the love of God, 
but we're united in our collective fragility in the love of God. And therefore, we all belong to each other, and we're all woven to each other. And so our concern is a little piece of fear in the burden that we carry, this little echo of the cares and burdens all over the world. And by freely choosing to participate in that and hand that over to God, that can also help as a form of em empathic communion with the collective preciousness of our soul. And something that helps me personally, share it because we all find our way. Because I'm up at night a lot. I always have been. And I walk around in the dark with my cane so I don't fall over. <clears throat> and so what I do, here's what helps me. One of the things that helps me, the things I just said I do, it helps me. Also, I listen to talks in the dark. I, I put in earphones, Krista Tippett, like a spiritual talk. There's other places. If I put it on real and set on the timer and just listen to a spiritual talk, it helps ground me in spiritual things that are also true. But something that helps me is I walk around in the dark and um, I, I, I realize that God is present in the darkness uh, in which I'm walking in round and round the, in the living room. And I, I also know that God is not just present in the dark, but God is somehow the reality of the darkness itself. And there's what I do is I talk to the dark. I talk to the dark. And knowing that as I talk to the dark, God hears me in the dark. In ways that I don't need, that I cannot and do not need to understand. So somehow by befriending the dark, recognizing God's presence in the dark, we realize that darkness is a kind of a sovereign, quiet, trustworthy darkness that is actually permeating the darkness of our fears. And I think that's the key, is how to, how to breathe in that sense of the sovereignty of the divinity of the darkness and then to permeate the fear so they form kind of an alchemy and it softens the edges of the fear. And that, that helps me to do that. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. That's, uh, that's a beautiful practice and thank, thank you so much. Um, I do like the idea too of, listening to talks like if, if you can put earphones in so if you someone else is in the room with you sleeping you don't wake them um and i i think potentially your lexio divina talks could be a nice way to kind of uh, meditate on those in the in the middle of the night yes. might be nice too yeah. i share with people that once i went on a pilgrimage to rome with jean vanier now a happy memory um and one of those pilgrimages with all these developmentally challenged children from all over the world gathered at St. Peter's. It was an amazing experience, really. And um, the woman, one of the women that I was watching there was a developmentally challenged woman who lived in Cleveland, where I lived. And she would come to my talks and she would record my talk, had a tape recorder, she would record my talk. So she, one year she came and she gave me a gift of the cloud of unknowing. And in the front page of the book, she wrote, Love is not an emotion, it's a gift of God from me to you. I'm sure her mother would had her say that right at that. It was sweet that she gave it to me. And she says, you know, every night I, I turn on the recording talks that you give. She said, you put me to sleep every night, she said. <laughs> and she meant it as a, as a source of gratitude, you know what I mean? Yes, and not as yes. what happened to her. She's listening to me on the retreats. But, um, yes. but it is nice having a soothing... It's nice to sing mm -hmm. to beautiful things, and we know they're beautiful because they're true. And in our mm -hmm. fear, we forget them. See, that's the problem. If we can stay connected to the beauty that's as and more real than the fear and permeates the fear, that, that kind of uh, inc incarnational process, I think, is, is transformative, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people would be grateful right now if, if you could put them back to sleep yeah, yeah. in the really, middle of yeah. the night. <laughs> Really, I'd be great if I could put myself back to sleep. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, on to some questions from our listeners. Uh, the first question is from Tim, and he says that uh, he leads a small group of, of people one Thursday a month through meditation practice, including Lexio Divina. So, Jim, can you please speak to the novice person who's doing a sitting practice, and what to expect from engaging in the practice. What is the point of doing the practice regularly? And how do I gauge the benefit of the practice 
and if what I'm doing is working. Yeah. Um, by the way, when we get to the phase in these reflections, we're talking about the cloud of unknowing. Um, and also other mystics also will be talking about this first phase, which is the phase of Lexio. Let, let's say what, what let's say what Lexio is. One way of looking at it is that say there, there is our faith, there's our sense of faith, that God's present in our life, whatever tradition we're in and, and how we experience that. But we also know that the truths of our faith tend to be somewhat distant or re somewhat removed from the immediacy of the complexities of our daily life, like the conditions of our daily life kind of overtake um, the truths of our faith. So the, 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 we realize this challenge we face is that, that the, um, the, ch the challenge that we all face in our life is that the the, the, the complexities of the day eclipse our capacity to be experientially grounded in the truths of our faith. So what meditation and prayer is then is a way of freely choosing, it's a set of graced strategies for freely letting the concerns of the day kind of fall into the background as we devote ourselves to the lexio, and the lexio in this sense is really a state of a, of a sustained attentiveness, see, to a beauty not yet thought about. And so in the lexio, like primarily scripture, the words of Jesus or scripture, but any, the teachings of the saints or anyone whose voice, whose words access us with the truth of God see, that inspires us or touches us or reassures us. So that when we practice the Lexio, what it does, it teaches us to listen. See, it teaches us to set aside the anxiety into the background and focus instead on taking in God speaking to us in this word. We take it to heart. We take it to heart. Then in taking it to heart, then the meditatio, the med Lexio Divina, then the meditation, then what, what's received in the state of attentiveness infused with love activates a dialogue between ourself and God, a loving exchange between ourself and God. So God talks to us in the Lexio, and then we talk to God. And we share with God in a sincere way how the word that God just spoke in our heart touches us. What questions does it raise? Where are we at with that? And then we sit more and we read the text again, or we go into the next passage, and we go back and forth and back and forth. And that back and forth process of the listening the, the active engagement of the meditatio leads to the prayer which comes from the heart center, which is the, the desire, help me with this. So this practice then, uh, the, the, see that that which is essential never imposes itself. That which is unessential is constantly imposing itself. So in a, a higher order imperative of the awakened heart, we freely choose to lean into this ever so delicate, non-impositional truth of God's word on our heart. And then when the meditation ends, we ask God to give us the grace not to break the thread of that sensitivity as we go through our day. So the habit of that, that fidelity to the daily rendezvous, helps to habituate us in this kind of state as we go through the day, which can then lead into more contemplative, non-reflective forms of wordless communion with God. And Jim, uh, for, the, for the beginner, the person may be doing, this, doing that for the very first time, um, the, the question, how do I gauge the benefit of the practice and if what I'm doing is working, what, what coaching would you give to someone? Well, I would say that, um, you know, first of all, the first thing to notice is your desire to even try it. Because the desire to even try to learn this art form, this, of, of the gentle art of contemplative living, bears witness that the awakening you're searching for is already occurring. Mm -hmm. And even though there may be voices inside, like internalized critical voices, like you're not gonna get far, what do you think you're doing, whatever. To know that chorus of voices, whatever they are, uh, we keep leaning into the voice of God that speaks to us in a very different way. And the words of encouragement, the words of love, the words of we're unexplainably loved in the midst of the unresolved and all of that. So I think that's the most important thing, is the, the purity of the intention, which is the childlike sincerity of even desiring it. And then knowing 
that what we're asked to do here is to be very patient with ourselves. Very patient with ourselves. And so little by little, as we just quietly, because it's never other than the intimate immediacy of our present ability to do it. It, it, We're met there. And over time, if we just stay there, over time, we can watch it grow and deepen. I I would say that it'd be some things to consider that would help for the beginner. Thomas Merton once he Thomas Merton once said he said let's face it we're beginners all of our life mm. we're going to die a beginner so so <laughs> how can we learn to be because we're in water over our head you know, we're in the mercy of God we can't comprehend it so how can we learn to be a humbled wise and patient beginner uh, you know along this path of awakening you know? mm-hmm. uh, when I was a very beginner in this practice I do remember. Um, a sense of uh, frustration about not being able to clear my mind or not being able to focus or not being able to, you know, the way I get distracted. And what really helped me in your teaching, Jim, was how I deal with that frustration if I can continue to bring God's loving voice and patience and into the way I deal with my frustration about the practice then I'm starting to attune to the way God's right. present in my practice. Well, that's exactly right. When Thomas Burton once said in the monastery to novices, he said, you know, sometimes in prayer, what we think of as distractions are really the way we're being inspired to tend to untended things. So instead of being distracted by the distraction, we would make a loving attentiveness to that which distracts us to be our meditation. See, why? What is it about this concern that scares me so? How far back would I have to go to find the very first time I had feelings about this issue? See? And how could I ask you, Lord, to help me to recognize your presence in the midst of this? And how might I be willing to go into frames of reference that are beyond this and sustain me in it like you like you work with? And then once you've tended to that, then quietly set it aside and return to the practice. See? If it mm-hmm. comes back again, go back again and do it some more. Mm-hmm. And the next day, sit down and do it some more. And so what you're doing is you're constantly like riding the waves of the sincere reality of yourself as you are in the presence of God, which is the practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's so helpful, Jim. And I think this is why I have so resonated with your teaching as as a way to, to enter into the practice because it's always the um, the loving response to anything that arises is actually the practice. Exactly. Yeah. And I do remember like a switch going off in myself at some point when I realized how frustrated I could become at myself or how fr- frustrated I could become at my distraction and realizing, oh, oh, this is actually the opportunity right here to do what Jim's been teaching yeah. me, which is to bring... Yes the voice of God's love into, yeah. and open my heart to God's That's presence. Right. See, because I think the, the wounded ego, uh, it's just unrelenting and, and keep generating the obstacles. So what happens is, mm-hmm. let's say we hear this approach. We go, that sounds lovely. That sounds lovely. What I'll do is I'll sit <laughs> and turn to what it is in the presence of God. And then, then we, we're monitoring how effectively we're able to do that. And then we get frustrated that we can't do that because we can't see. Yeah. And that's the point. See, the, 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 <laughs> the point is God's unconditionally loving us in our inability to do it. God's not waiting us to be able to do it to start to love us. See? And then we can start to maybe calibrate our heart to a finer scale and break it down into smaller parts, like what's the fear made out of. That experiential self-knowledge in the presence of God is, is the way I think we, we, you know, we move on. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jim. That's so helpful. Another thing I think that really helps also is to have a counterpoint of a blessing, a person in our life, a relationship in our life, a ministry in our life, a gift in our life, the sun moving across the sky, the fact we're breathing in and are breathing out, and switch mm. over and on purpose stabilize ourselves and how real the blessing is and how deep it is, how much it means to us. And then we can start to see how we're canceling out the blessing by this contracted intensity of the fear-based concern. And by letting the blessing flow into the concern, you get you get more of a realistic picture of the balance of things in God's in God's ways in our life. Yeah. 
Mm. That's that's really helpful. Do you think, Jim, um, for a beginner then, they might even have that blessing in mind before they start the practice so they're ready to turn to it? Yeah, you could. You know, for, for example, I'll say it would be a way to begin. So I'll, I'll say it as a prayer. It mm-hmm. could be any text of Scripture because every word of Jesus echoes with what I'm saying now, really. It's good news, really. Is you would sit down in the presence of God, in effect, you would say this to God, like, Lord God, I know you're here now all about me and within me. St. Augustine says you're closer to me than I am to myself. And you are your infinite love is being poured out and given to me as my very life. See? And I'm being sustained by you unexplainably in this moment in blessings that I can't even begin to comprehend. So it's in your presence that I'm asking you to help me to be more experientially aware of this loving presence is always there. Mm-hmm. And, and as the ground out of which I then touch the hurting places and look at the hurting places. And I'm asking for this grace because I tend to do the opposite. I start out with my hurt, see, and then I try to get past my hurt from the vantage point of my hurt instead of starting out with the love that sustains me in my hurt. And uh, mm-hmm. so I find that kind of an, like uh, it, uh, a kind of invitational, welcoming prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It it's kind of creates the context for the meditation to proceed. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Jim. That reminds me too of what we were talking about earlier with the broken sleep and how to uh, t- turning to blessings might be another right. way to help calm the, really. the system when we wake up in the middle of really. the night. An example I gave in the Merton talk to the sessions, I think is Merton had insomnia. And uh, he's lying there, and he, he writes, he said, and suddenly the bed becomes an altar, and in a distant city somewhere, someone is able to pray. See? So that our that kind of quiet mm. inner integrity of being awake in the presence of God radiates out and touches the world in ways we don't understand. And uh, I think that's another, you know, that's another kind of transformative way to um, drift off to sleep, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. This question's from Cindy, and there, there were a couple of questions on this topic that I'm going to read to you, uh, and this is the topic around practice and depression. So Cindy asks, I feel hopeless and unmotivated most of the time. What can I do for myself to still pursue the contemplative way of living, yet temper that with the reality of my, oh, yet temper that with the reality of my depression? Will the contemplative way of life that I'm seeking begin to ease some of the depression? I want to speak first, um, say as a psychologist, about depression. And then take a look at how spirituality can be a healing resource in the healing of depression. Like whether spirituality touches depression. I'm going to speak about the psychological reality of depression. Um, You know, depression is a serious thing. And uh, it comes in different forms. So there can be kind of a chronic dysthymia, like a low-grade depression. There could be the depression arising from unprocessed trauma. There can be a a, a genetic predisposition to depression if our parents were depressed. It's a physiological, it's a psychiatric, meaning more of a chemical thing, correlative to uh, hypertension or correlative to other medical conditions that merge with psychological. It can also become a certain habituated way we tend to see things, uh, catastrophizing and seeing things with things. And it can, it can weigh on us. See? So the first thing, I think, is to know that we're doing what we're doing to free ourselves from the symptoms of depression. Uh, through therapy, if we have access to it, um, thinking it through, working it through, being with someone who's trained to help people, work through depression. If we need medication to help us stabilize the neurotransmitters of depression to do that. In other words, you know that you're doing what you're doing. To, next, whatever the rituals are that, that nurture you, you know, the, the walk, the whatever, we all have our little self-soothing rituals that you're being good to yourself, uh, personal hygiene, food, exercise, friends, like this. And so you're doing those things, like you're doing your homework with the depression as you kind of work through that and where you are with that. So then you say, then you turn to God see, for help. See. And so God, you'd ask God for the grace to inspire you and guide you 
in your ongoing efforts to be healed from depression as an ongoing process, like help, help me to whatever it is I need to do and we do that. But then what you also do is say, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn from you the way that you're hidden deep within me and invincibly in the midst of my depressed heart. Because I, I am depressed. A lot of people are depressed. I'm one of them. See? A lot of people are anxious. I might be one of them. A lot of people are addicted. I might be one of them. We all have our litany of brokenness. You have yours. I have mine. But the thing, Lord, is you're present in the d hidden depths of my traumatized heart, which is the preciousness of my heart that's buried under the rubble of my depression. So I'm trying to find my way up out of the rubble of the internalized depression. And I'm asking for your guidance in this, that I might take to heart the truth of the things that you tell me about myself. And in that spirit, then, if you're in the Christian tradition, you'd open the Gospels. And what does Jesus have to say? This sheds a consoling light into the depression so that we might hold on to it as a way to counter the depression, like a counterpoint to the depression. Mm. And so those, those would be some things that I would suggest uh, it's a personal quiet, you know, because mm -hmm. depression is so personal. All these things are personal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when she says that, um, will the contemplative way of life begin to ease some of the depression? I, I, I guess it's not guaranteed it will it, ease the symptoms of depression, but it. How yeah, I put it, how I put it is this. The contemplative way of life, it, uh, how I put it, it doesn't mean that we're no longer afraid when scary things happen but rather fear no longer has tyranny over our heart. It doesn't mean we're no longer sad when sad things happen. The sadness no longer has tyranny over our heart. Just as someday we hope when we die, we'll die and our death will not have tyranny over our heart. So what we can do is in our depression, maybe know that this, is, this might be our path, and it'll be fairly chronic. It takes courage to deal with depression. It takes resourcefulness. It takes perseverance. But, but to, to know that in the midst of my depression, I'm asking for the grace of my depression, not have tyranny over my heart. My depression doesn't have the authority to name who I am. See, I am not what's wrong with me. Only your infinite love for me has the authority to name who I am as unexplainably precious in the midst of my depression. And I, I'm trying to discover that. And the more I discover that, the more I think it can help to actually then lighten the depression. See, mm. yeah. Thank you, Jim. I just want to repeat, repeat that phrase. It's so helpful uh, to know that I'm not what's wrong with me. That's the issue. Yeah, yeah really, it's, it's really the, the idolatry of conditioned states over the infinite love that sustains us in those states. And really, a, a lot of meditation is about the healing of, a lot of faith is about the healing of that, I think. This is a question from Ian who says, I feel as if I'm actually getting worse at meditation. He said he's been practicing meditation for a number of years and that he's getting worse at it and find myself easily distracted and barely able to maintain any focus. I used to sit for quite a while with no problem. I've slowly lost my ability to do so. I've become very depressed and, and I'm experiencing a lot of anxiety lately. Am I just coming to the end of my rope and need to let go to see what might come next. Is this a normal progression in the contemplative journey? I feel so helpless and lost. I want to answer first psychologically, then I want to answer in terms of the dark night. So, <clears throat> um, I want to approach it first psychologically, say if he and I could talk, like find out some more things. There would be some questions. When you were going along, you used to meditate much better. If you look back to when it started, the meditation started to not go so well. What was going on? See, was there was there anything going on at the time, or the remembrance of a past thing reactivated itself that could help you to understand what started this shift see, uh, toward the difficulty and depression? And and what would it be to like retrace the threads of that back to unpack it psychologically and in the presence of God? Because maybe what you're being asked to do, some what surface is some yet to be dealt with issue. It's still like lodged, stuck in your throat. You know, it's just like right there, and you're being asked to, to look at it, and walk through it and understand it. Because we, we can't. There's just things we can't pray away, see? because we're incarnate beings. So one, there's that. See? 
and what do I need to deal with? And maybe it's something, and it's, it might be ongoing. I'm carrying it inside of me. So you, whatever might come. Let's say you check it out. You look at that. And you say, you know what? Well, there's some of that, but I don't think that's it. See, I, I don't. Um, you know, I look at myself, and I'm, I'm, I'm no more tr- no more sinful than usual. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm still just me, and uh, life's hard. And I don't. I don't. I don't. I can't trace it back to some decisive event. So what could also be going on, and this is John of the Cross, the Dark Knight, is that uh, that on this earth we experience and respond to God's presence mediated through faith. That is, it's mediated through belief, through inspirations, through consolations, through mediations of God's presence in our life. But this is not our ultimate destiny. See? Our destiny is unmediated communion with God forever, the divinization through love forever. And God sees that uh, that uh, we're attached to these finite, mediated ways of experiencing God's presence. And God is seeking to free us up to, to be in a more boundless state of presence. And God knows that as long as we still have access to those finite means of experiencing God's presence, we won't let go of them. So God lovingly removes our ability to be nurtured in the customary ways we were nurtured. And we're left in kind of the aridity or a state of powerlessness. Someone once called it a hell of mercy, really. And we have nowhere to turn. We have nowhere to turn. And we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And we learn to wait in this unexplainable place we didn't see coming which is really the harbinger uh, for this infinite love of this tasting of this mystical union. And sometimes instead of either or, it's both. See, sometimes, uh, and likewise, if you're going through the dark night, but you're subject to depression, the dark night can trigger your depression. But likewise, the depression carefully tended to can open out upon experiences of the dark night in which God is strangely found in some unfelt way, sustaining you in a broken place. So I, I think it's helpful to consider think, things along those lines can be helpful as discernment of what's happening. Another thing I suggest to people is stop meditating for a while. Watch Jerry Seinfeld read ones. You know, <laughs> really, I mean, who, who cares? You know, have go have lunch. <laughs> You know, take take <laughs> take a walk, and uh, uh, you know, like relax, relax. And then after you take a little breather from what, is it, what isn't going so well, come back because God's present in the pleasures, God's present in the life, God's present in the thing, and come back and give it another try. Sometimes that's, that's that little break, it mm-hmm. kind of it hits a reset button, and sometimes that's that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and just going back to what we talked about earlier. <laughs> The way you treat yourself through all of that is also recognition of your, your faith that God, even though you're not experiencing God's presence, God God is still present to you. That's right. And yeah. you see, because I I think the sincerity of our tender heartedness towards ourselves and our brokenness is the presence of God, mm. whatever form that takes, and mm-hmm. uh, that might that mean for some people for a time leaving behind pressure or not going to church. I mean, we have to trust ourselves you know we have to listen to the promptings of our body and our heart and go with the flow with where we're at and do our best with it and have an open mind you know? mm-hmm. there was something you said in that answer that i i just want to repeat as well which was you said there's some things we can't pray away and i do think um we do see people who have the hope um that that their spiritual practice will resolve all the incarnate issues and that can lead to to a kind of bypassing of what's n- the necessary work of good psychology or I think we do think yeah. that and then when it doesn't work then we lose faith in God or we think something's wrong but there's things yeah. in life we can't pray away like my, my the, the pain I feel about my wife's death sleeping mm-hmm. alone every night I can't pray that away I cannot mm. pray my sadness away see but I can learn to pray in the midst of my sadness and learn to listen to it and see what it has to teach me about life and love and whatever. So um, prayer is not a, a remedy for getting rid of difficult situations. It's a, it's a mm-hmm. kind of a graced clarity that allows us to be clear-minded 
and real and open in the midst of our situations. It's a, it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really helpful, Jim. So even going back to Ian's question about feeling so helpless and lost, there's a there's a prayer that can be prayed in the midst of That's that. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know that saying, I heard, I forget who said it. He said, that, you know, my goal is to live forever. So far, so good. See, so what I can't do is pray away my death. See, so far, so good. But it's, it's, already, in the, it's, <laughs> it's already in the mail. See, and, and so far as I find it troubling, <laughs> that's how I can't pray away <laughs> my death. Cause I, I could, you know what I mean? I, could, I just can't, yeah. I can't pray away the realities of my incarnate existence on this earth. And I don't have to. Say I had to find God's mm -hmm. presence in the incarnate realities and work. I should do my best to have prayer be a way to move me past suffering that hinders my heart and helps. I should do my best with that always. But grounded in a peace is not dependent on my ability to do that. I, try, I hand the rest over to God and God works with that. I think. Turning to the mystics will continue in a moment. A question from Laurie. She says, it seems that as I deepen my journey and become more attentive and open, that I'm having both more and less difficulty in living my regular life. I feel more peaceful and grounded and yet more sensitive to stimuli. I can feel more easily overstimulated and need to retreat more. I also feel harshness so much more deeply and almost physically. I then question some of my friendships because I feel like in being too open, too vulnerable, that in the end uh, I vo involuntarily retract and in some ways am uninterested in a lot of conversations. Is this a normal part of the journey? Yes. Well, you know, as Johnny Cash said, I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. Because of you, I walk the line. See? And I think what happens is that um, it's really true, this prayer opens up our heart. But it opens up our heart and sensitizes us to the price we pay for being awake. And therefore, we have to learn to, I like Chalk and Trump or Rinpoche, my raw and beautiful heart. I need to be very careful. See, how, how can I open my heart to the suffering of the world without being traumatized and overwhelmed by the suffering of the world? See? So how can I pace, how can I back off and guard see, the treasure of my heart, the pearl of great price, so that when I reach out to touch the hurting place in myself or another person, I realize that in that touch of love, some of the pain that I'm touching flows back through the touch into me. See? And so I have to pace my, my, my empathic vulnerability to the suffering within myself, especially that I've been more opened up to it in my prayer. So it calls for a kind of a refined, uh, like courageous prudence in pacing and trusting the opening to kind of watch over ourselves. I mean, I think that's, you know, that, I think that's the art form of it. And then I think when it comes to sharing it with others, you know, Jesus, don't cast your pearls before a swine, you know. Them underfoot. We need to be very careful to sense if I'm going to share something vulnerable like this, <clears throat> is this person capable of honoring what I'm about to share? Or is it they'll be dismissive towards it, or they won't get it, or they won't, you know? And uh, therefore, I kind of learn to discern the invitational moments where I can find someone to share. And if they can reciprocate and hear it, I can share it a little more. They can, we can see where that goes. But sometimes when we open up because we want so badly to have someone understand what matters more than anything else, and they don't understand it, it can even pain the pain of our aloneness. See? And we have to decide what to do with that. We have to sort that out. So I think mm -hmm. those are very delicate things. Being mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. Too. Uh, and I really resonate with Laurie's description there too, that as as I moved through practice over the years, that the increase in... Um, a sense of vulnerability and um, empathy with suffering. and um, But I do wonder, Jim, with the friendships piece, um, how do we keep a state of humility? Because I can also see the flip side of feeling like I, I know better than other people. They, they can't understand me. Um, so how do, how do we keep that sense of humility around our friendships? And yeah. 
Well, by, well, by the way, let's say we're committed to this path. Mm-hmm. And let's say that accompanied with certain, um, uh, we've been endowed with certain gifts or predispositions or sensitivities and, and so on. In, in which case, it's kind of brought us to a point of clarity. And when, we, when we're with somebody, we're kind of aware that this person has not yet come to the point of clarity that we've come to. You can see that. They're still kind of struggling with something. And then for how do we avoid a kind of a one-up feeling of superiority over mm-hmm. the other person? Yes. Uh, kind of a condescending attitude. Mm-hmm. First of all, so some things that help me with it, first of all, is to know that the truth uh, the, the, tr- the truths in which we've been awakened. Everything that we have, we've been given, and we've been given to give it. See? And we've been given to give it to ourselves and to each person we meet who's suffering. It isn't for us as some kind of claim to hold on to as something about ourselves, but rather it's, it's love accessing us as a call to be even more Christ-like and loving to each person. I also know, how, however gifted I might be, I also know in so, an experiential self-knowledge, uh, I, 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 have all, I have my own more than enough wounds to deal with. See? Uh, Brent once said, we're all a bunch of dopes, but we're loved dopes. See? <laughs> and uh, we're all broken, and, and whatever it is I know pales in comparison to what I don't know yet. Also, the preciousness of anybody is not dependent on the degree to which they realize their preciousness. Their preciousness is the preciousness of God that shines out of the mystery of who they are. Look at a, look at a, 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 a mother, say, bathing in her infant child. Here this child can't do anything, can't do anything, and yet she's smitten see, by the preciousness of that child like that. And see, that's the true value. And so the attained value that comes through life is a value that is in the service of seeing that. And it's a, not in this comparative, which in its own way is real. But if we're not careful, it just gets in our way. And, and um, yeah, so. It, That's so helpful. Because I do think um, what you shared about choosing people who are safe to be vulnerable with and, and might be able to attune to you is, is really helpful. And then, but the, the, the rest of the relationships, the community, the friendships, it's more about then living into yes. the gift of love that, that you're being given. That's right. Um, That's right. And, I, and I would like to apply this podcast to this, we say the living school and CAC and so on. See, I would say to all the people that are listening to this podcast and benefiting from it, that we form a community of contemplative seekers. And in the company of each other, we're not alone in things that matter most. See? We're not alone in things that matter most. And so we, 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 we can look for a, a prayer group, a sitting group, a centering prayer group, a Bible study. We can, we're just certain friends. We can, you can kind of sense, you know, we're in the presence of a fellow seeker, which, which you are able to share. And you can also sense you're in the presence of people God infinitely loves that aren't aware of this. And so we're always kind of just going with the flow of what's real and being grateful for the connections that are there. And also, I think when we read the mystics, you know, you can read John of the Cross, 16th century, but his deathless presence shines out in everything he says, and they keep us company. You know, we're in the companionship of um, the eternal preciousness of these teachers down through the ages that still live on in our heart. Let us know that we're not alone. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Beautiful. I love um, the reflection on the community listening to this podcast and these questions that come in are just so helpful for kind of concretizing that so that we can hear each other and you can uh, be present to what's happening for people in the community. You know, when I was teaching uh, (coughs) high school religion, I wrote high school religion textbooks and taught seniors. And also with college classes that I've taught or on retreats, you know, the 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 student the, the student is revealed by the quality of their question. Okay. You know, it's 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 not the one who has the answer. The one who read the answer is not because they read the book. You know, they have the answer, but it's the person who who you hope read the book. They did their assignment. I mean, that goes how it goes. But really, it's it's the sincerity from which that their question is expressing. That is the reality of the clarity that they're coming to themselves. 
And that's what makes these questions so relevant, I think. You know? Like Roka learned to love the questions. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, in re relationship to community, there is a question from uh, Becky who resonated when you said, Jim, um, this Catholic church of mine, what a hyper hypocritical, patriarchal, condescending, yeah. self-righteous, oh. beautiful, tender, mysterious community this is. And uh, she, Becky really resonated with that and is struggling um, with how to orient to her church community. So she asked you, what can I learn from the mystics about staying with this community I have loved in the face of such discouragement and frankly disgust at the hypocrisy, patriarchy, et cetera? Etc. <laughs> really? Well, you know what? One, I think it depends to, on several things. One, there are some faith communities where the, if it's in the Catholic tradition, say the pre, the pastor, the priest, or the deacon, or it is, they really, they really are spiritually insensitive, judgmental, uh, 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 right, all that. You know, it, so, it can be so pervasive. And what you're looking for is so absent. Sometimes people are better off not going. You know, why put yourself through that? Why put? Because the church is a mystery. You know, the mystical body is Christ is all pervasive inside. You can sit alone in the meditation with the scriptures open in, a, in the media ecclesia, in the midst of the church. You do your practice. Another thing you can do is look for the, for the faith community that is there, where the leadership is our people of prayer. It might not even be in your own denomination. But it has that vibrancy of uh, of piety and sincerity and seeking that nurtures and feeds you, and they promote that. Like that, and the other approach is a lot of times it's in between. It's like a relationship where it's, it's not good enough to stay, and it's too bad to stay, and not good enough to leave. You know, you, 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 you're in a relationship with the church like that. So what what mm -hmm. I what I find helpful is this: several things. One, when I sit there in the church to listen in the readings to one thing in the scriptures that touches my heart. And in the homily, what's the one thing the person giving the homily, the homily said that I know rings true to me and is helpful. And to also know that all these people came here out of a communal sincerity of seeking the presence of God in their life. And for all their brokenness, I am my brokenness am one with these people. And God loves these people. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we're asked to be kind of a, a quiet, prophetic presence, like a contemplative, graced, broken person who's just quietly present, like the anonymity of God. You don't, you just, you're there. And you feel called mm -hmm. to be that way with those people. You'll also find if you look very closely, there's little subsets in the community of people that are more awake, you know, more concerned. And you kind of gather around those clusters of subsets within the big community. But the church itself is a big tent. You know, I mean, a lot of everyone's mm -hmm. in there, and everyone's well, mm -hmm. everyone's welcome, and uh, and we're all invited to the wedding feast, and uh, mm -hmm. so anyway, those are some things that helped me. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. So, Jim, this is the last question for today, and it comes from Ed, and he says he seems to be conflicted at times when meditating or praying. He says that I think I hear you, Jim, speaking about the presence of God in everything, and I can really identify with that. But I also hear in prayer and meditation reference of prayer to a relationship with a personal God. I'm trying to resolve that difference. Yes, you know, there's a, a Hindu teacher I like very much, Ramakrishna, and uh, a yogi on Namaste. He had this God consciousness. <clears throat> and uh, there's a, one of his books where he has these interviews he would have with people, like spiritual direction. And uh, the person was speaking of the presence of God in everything. But the person was having trouble with people who think of God as a personal relationship. Yes. And Ramakrishna said to the person, he said, I think you're really coming into a deep sense of God beyond form. I don't think that you've come into a sense of God with form. And so God is present in everything. But in our tradition, see, it's the, it's the primacy of love in God's personal creation. See, the, real is, the issue is not why is there something rather than nothing, but why is there someone rather than no one? And you're that someone, see, that, 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 the, that the infinite subjectivity of God is being poured out and given as the mystery of my very subjectivity, heart to heart, person to person, unexplainably forever. 
And so I'm to I'm awakened to this in my psychological subjectivity. I hear it, I have opinion. But really what I'm preaching toward is uh, Dan Walsh in philosophy classes at the monastery used to say we must transcend objectivity, we must transcend subjectivity, we must find a way to trans subjectivity. See how is my deeply personal it's like reading the poetry of John of the Cross. It's so personal. You know, these mystics when you read read what they say out loud is so personal to them. That's not hearsay, it's not a theory. It's it's in the ground of their body. It's embodied in who they are. And so you realize then that you the mystery of who you are as a person is becoming more and more identified with the with the infinite personal presence of personal presence of God. As, as the person okay, that we are and are called to be in the mystery of God's infinite subjectivity. Thomas Merton says, if God is a Holy Spirit called Father, and if God is a Holy Spirit called Son, is it possible that the Holy Spirit is a, is the, is the God who has taken, that the name of the Holy Spirit is my name? that God takes to herself, God takes to himself fully and personally in the depths of my heart. See, in the name of the Father, the Son, and James Finley, amen. See, is, is, this, <laughs> is, this, is this possible that, the, the, it's, mm. it's, it's, that God's not all that interested in my spirituality? God's infinitely interested in me. See, God's in love with me. See, and God wants me to taste how infinitely in love God is with me so that I am being so taken by being loved so I give myself to the personal love of God, this infinite, boundaryless, and transcendent. And so the two work together that way, the personal and transpersonal and the being of God, the ontology of things are the names of God or modalities of God. And I think this is, so, this is important for us in the Christian tradition about the Christ and God, God's revealed to us as a person, among persons. Uh, infused with this deathless presence. And um, the question is, what is the transpersonal, personal love see, that shines in the person that we each are? And I, I, I think along the, my little book, Burton's Palace of Nowhere, on the true self, has a lot of this in it on identity, on ultimate identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jim, what you just, your answer there really gets at the heart of what the mystics are trying to teach us and and it's not easy to learn because it's it's a both and situation and we like to be very linear and black and white about answers and so yeah here's how i put it one way i put it <clears throat> it's like back in the good old days when i was holy it was so clear <laughs> but for quite some time now i'm perplexed and i'm perplexed because i, I was caught mid-sentence Access by a love that unraveled me see, and leaves me with nowhere to stand except in the love that took me to itself. See. And through the gift of tears, to being, being moved so in the depths of myself in this way, how do I learn to let myself be led by the love that accessed me and is transforming into itself? And that's the, you know what I mean, the intimate interiority mm -hmm. of the echoes of heaven in my heart, I think. Mm -hmm. And really sitting with these practices you're offering and just slowly and patiently letting this unfold from within is, is, a, is the practice. It is the practice. Yeah. See, in, a, in another way of looking at it, let's say I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I have this buzz of my distractions and I can't get past the distractions. And I say to God, look at me sitting here with all these distractions. So then God interiorly says to me, I agree. I, I, I agree. I can see your things aren't going well for you at all. But I think it's helpful to know that the the, the, the the tenacity of your distractions in no way whatsoever hinders me being infinitely in love with you in the midst of your distractions. See? And if you could join me in discovering that, see, then the, 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 your distractions would be your, like the thorn in the flesh. See, it would be the constant teacher drawing you back to the love that loves you so in the midst of it. And I think it's a, the artistry of it is along those lines, I think. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Jim. I go back to what I shared at the beginning that we're in COVID-19 and I know I'm not at my best, but uh, it's great to hear that reassurance that uh, showing up with sincerity of heart and a desire to be with God and bring God's presence. And you know what else I think too about that 
the virus and what we're talking about now. Let's say I'm sitting here like this, and I'm, I'm refining my ability to be clear about such things. Right now, all over the world, there are people slipping away in death with their loved ones wringing their hands, sobbing their eyes out, not handling it well at all. Who am I to think that I'm supposed to be exempt from that ineptness and that poverty and that pain? And it is not my very inability, my point of interconnectedness with them, see, in the love that sustains me and sustains them. And that's where I think something like this can really help us. To, I need to take care of myself because otherwise I become one more traumatized human being that needs to be helped. So I need to take care of myself and stay grounded and clear-minded. But I'm clear-minded for the sake of the tenderness. I'm clear-minded for the sake of the empathy. I'm clear-minded. And I think that's the quality of it, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that in mind, Jim, we might end this podcast with just maybe you could give us a word or two to help us be in solidarity with uh, people who are grieving, people who are suffering, for those of us who have the opportunity to listen to a podcast like this, could you just lead us into a, a blessing? No, and with a prayer, that. with this, like this. Thank you. Um, Lord God, we are so grateful that you have awakened us to this desire for yourself and the desire to share your loving presence with everyone that we meet. We're grateful for these beautiful words that we know are true, that you're deeply present in the midst of these unresolved things. And so we ask from you the grace to continue to deepen our obediential fidelity to learning to depend on you sustaining us rather than depending on our inability, on our abilities to get past or beyond anything at all. And by being such a person, may we be someone in whose presence other people are a little bit better able to sense this preciousness in themselves. And may we extend this blessing out to everyone in the world. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, James Finley and all our <laughs> listeners. Yeah. You, say your own name. Make the sign of the cross and say your own name. Uh, amen. There you go. Amen. Good prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics a podcast created by the Center for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions. So if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.